Um, here was Sean McCauley, uh, the son of Fardoyne legend Harry McCauley. Harry was a, a Northern Ireland pro champion in the 50s. A fellow with Sean, talk to me about your father. Well, he, 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 he probably had about 100, 150 professional amateur fights. And uh, as I say, uh, he, had, he, had, he won Ulster junior titles and he progressed to the point where he represented Ireland against Scotland, as you can see here in the picture, you know. Uh, the picture is, uh, is a proof of that, you know, with the Irish face. And as I said, it was probably in the Irish, and his time, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to him in the amateurs, was, uh, was representing Ireland. And, and a nice face. He was Ulster Junior champion, Ulster, uh, junior, Ulster Senior finalist. Ulster Junior bantamweight champion and Ulster Senior bantamweight champion. And you have to appreciate that everybody was a boxing man. So the competition, you know, uh, would have been immense. Well, the lack of TV and the lack of entertainment put people into boxing clubs and uh, packed them out till, till the doors, which meant you had you had, if you want to use a phrase, Tom, Dick and Harry in the clubs. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were all hard men. They were hard men. They, they were went in and had a 40 for your dinner. You know, so that's the kind of competition you had in the gyms, you know. So Harry, your father Harry was married uh, to Sarah, your mother. Tell us who Sarah was and what stock she came from. Well, Sarah was my mother. Uh, no one asked Sarah money again before she was married. Her brother was Rinty Monaghan, and as I say, they had about, I think it was eight, eight brothers, and uh, there was five sisters. So I worked out about 13 of them, and I think it would have been even more again, only for a few mishaps, you know. But one of them, as I say, was Rinty Monaghan, who was flyweight champion of the world. And as I say, that was, by far, is probably his uh, most competitive spar mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in, in the gym where he was uh, training in, you know. I believe them spars were really something to behold. Tommy Monaghan, Rinty's brother, viewed a, a few of them. Yeah. He says him and they were sizzling hot. And Rinty was a flyweight, Harry McGranda was a, a flyweight. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, I think Manny Parker proves a lot of things here to the point where he come from the flyweight up to any foot elite middleweight. And as I say, we put Rendy in that same Katie category where he was flyweight. So uh, and against a, a featherweight was really nothing till a flyweight, you know, but it was also tales of my father wearing uh, wearing uh, sixteen inch gloves and Rendy wearing the eight inch gloves and sparring. Had made up for the weight. So it made up for that compensated for, for, yeah. for, for, for the weight. Right. But uh, a lot of the spars had to be stopped because uh, the, the they were the going too hard. Of yeah. it because that's what was yeah. called and asked yeah. for by the, the public and the people who was watching in them gyms. So your mummy and daddy reared just in Brompton Park? Oh yes, we were reared in Brompton Park. There was six of us. There was there was from the top, there was Ann, who was the oldest, living in California. And then my other sister, who was the second oldest, Peggy, who also lives in California. And then you take it on down the lane, uh, my brother Patsy, so known as Coco. And then you had Harry. Harry was the wild one. And then from that you had myself, Sean. And then the Bobby, who was George. George and I hit no one sixty. And he's living in uh, Manchester. He has been for over 20 years. Every one of us was involved in passing. McGranda, uh, he held the Northern Ireland title, which was a professional title, which was a big, big, big thing then. Because, as I said earlier, everybody was a boxing. Yeah, yeah. Well... And he won that against Billy Donnelly. Yeah. And lost it to Jim McCann. Yeah, it's it. He lost it to his boogeyman. His boogeyman was a man called Jim McCann. Jim McCann was a very, very hard man. Yeah, nobody stopped Jim McCann. And if Jim McCann was stopped, he was stopped with cut eyes. Uh, like my father sometimes would have been, uh, stoppages in his record would have been through cut eyes and stuff like that there. He fought uh, Jim McCann about four to five times. I know that four to five times, I think my father would have won one of them. You know, but he was always his Pokemon. And winning the uh, professional featherweight title, Billy Downey, I think it was just probably one of his best achievements in the uh, professionals, you know. Now, not forgetting some of these guys that he fought, and Liverpool and places like that there 
had uh, had uh, he fought, fought a few fought, fought for British teams. Yeah, Empire champions. Yeah. He fought a few champions. He did indeed. But one of his best wins was against the renowned uh, legendary trainer from Sheffield, Brendan Ingle. His brother Jimmy Ingle That's was true. an up and coming pro. He was knocking everybody out. It ended yeah. up with a glass chin, but nobody knew it at, at the time. Yeah. But when he fought McGranda, mm -hmm. he was heavily favoured to beat McGranda, but McGranda yeah. chinned him in the first round. Well, he was like the he was like the slave getting through into the land. He I happened to be sitting there with uh, my mother, uh, watching some of the fighters. Uh, he wasn't training at that time, but as had happened them times, uh, some of the people pulled out, and it happened regularly with the likes of Jimmy Jim Angle because. Uh, he was a big puncher and nobody stayed in the ring with Jim Angle too long. He was knocking them all out. So they asked my dad, would he, would he fight him, Harry McCauley? So up jumps dad, a few quid in it. He got out and get ready and, and get out and got it a bit hot and heavy, so he did in the first round. Coming into the second round, he touched for Angle and the next thing Angle was down, out, out like, a, like a bag of sponge, he was down on the canvas. My name is Tommy Monaghan, Reddy's brother. I'm also, uh, Harry McCauley was my brother-in-law, married to my sister, Sarah. Now, uh, we moved up to Ardoin right after the Blitz of 1940, I believe. And we were blitzed out of uh, Concord Street and moved up to Ardoin in 63 Hydro Gardens. Uh, at that time, why? I used to go to the, the, the gym and I watched Rinty and Harry McCauley sparring. They were great sparrers. In fact, sometimes the trainer had to come in and say, listen, and, and uh, I believe it was unbelievable to watch. They had to stop the spars. They were not they brutal. They were, at, they were really going to go and tongs at it. It was very good. And, uh, but I do remember... I went with Harry and he fought John Engel from Dublin. And they called John Engel called himself John L. Sullivan. And he he says, You may mock my style, but you must admit I can knock them out. And your dad, Harry, got a a, a fight with John Engel. And uh, I remember distinctly Frank McLaurin coming up to Ivory Gardens to tell him. He can fight John Ingle if he wanted to take the fight. And Harry would take on anybody, so he took on the fight. I think he got 10 or 15 pounds for the fight at that time. But I went there, I was a bucket boy. I held the water or whatever. And the fight started, and yes, Ingle had Harry a great shot on the, right on the, the, by the heart, and lifted him up up on his toes and people thought this was going to be the end of it but he kept after Harry and Harry caught him and knocked him down. Ingle got up and he knocked him down again and that was the end of the fight Seven. and I believe it was in the fourth round. Fourth round was it? Yeah. I think it was the fourth round. Right, well it was a stunning upset it because... Was a stunning upset. Yeah. That was the end of John Ingle's uh, Aura of invincibility because he'd been knocking everybody out. That's right. But it ended up he had a glass chin, but it was yeah. McGranda that exposed him. Exposed him, exactly. And Jim, then after that, everybody wanted to fight him. Yes, Jim McCann, Mike McGee, no one wanted to fight him. Until after Harry knocked him out, and then everybody wanted to fight him. And that was the end of him, he had a glass chin. And McGranda, uh, were you often up in the cave hill with McGranda and Rinty? Yeah, I was, whatever I was... I think it was around 14, 15. I would go up the hills with him, right up to the Cave Hill, and where he got his goat's milk. <laughs> and uh, of course, they did chopping trees and what have you. But they could run down the damn hill, which was unbelievable. Right. And that fall gets well, that quick. Wow. So, I think there's a photo that exists of them chopping wood, too. Yeah. I must uh, hunt that out. There is a photo. Right. Tommy, thanks very much yeah, for speaking yeah. to me. That was brilliant.
This time when I was down playing and running, the St. Gavin's Club with Charlie there, and your grandma was, was doing a bit of, you know, talking about boxing and all, and the guy, Charlie says, get on with Ted there. I can run your, your grandma sparring right back. No big, big bang. My nose, my nose got broke. So you were sparring with my granddad? Oh, Harry McCauley? Harry McCauley. No wow. big, no big, went right up that. But I've seen stars, so it was. Jeez. My nose went right that way there. The hell if I'm getting, getting straightened out. That was a hard introduction to, uh, oh, no, to boxing. Just, um, I'm a grand and ex professional, uh, uh, yeah. Northern Ireland champion. Yeah. But quite an age gap between you and him. I don't know what, yeah. So he was taking liberties? What? I he, don't know. I think he was. Diabolical liberties? He, he was that cocky, so he wasn't. He, just, right. well, he knew more about him. I said, I seen, I seen, first time I've seen stars. <laughs> right. Uh, and are you oh. saying McGrand retired you? What? <laughs> are you saying McGrand retired you? I wasn't far off it. You packed it in <laughs> after that? From the fighting streets of Belfast came one of the great rivalries in Irish sports. John Caldwell and Freddie Gilroy were about the same age and about the same weight. Thank you. And they were destined to be forever linked together in Belfast boxing folklore. I don't know if going to cost our fortune. <laughs> well, I was just, I helped John as a schoolboy, juvenile, youth, junior, senior. We had been friends, we had been teammates. We were in the same Irish team that went all over the world together. You know, we went to America, Canada, Australia. We went to Germany together. We went to, you name it, we've been there. Freddie Gilroy and John Caldwell turned pro. And between them, won British, Commonwealth, European, and world titles. It was inevitable that the former roommates at the Melbourne Games would eventually fight each other as professionals. Even prior to the fight, every night till the Philip Fever was about the fight. You know, the two local boys, what's going to happen, how are they going to prepare for the fight. It ended up, I forgot all about papers, reading papers about the fight, and concentrated on how I was going to defend my title and win it and keep my titles. Uh, John, I, I felt read the papers and read the papers too much and still they come in for more any fight i went to mass in the morning of the fight and i asked for guidance and for not no injury to come to my opponent or myself but when i got into the ring i probably hurt him he hurt me but that is boxing Round nine, and Johnny Caldwell has definitely got a very badly cut eye. His seconds have managed to patch it up for the time being, but how long will that last? What a dramatic fight. It started off with a cut eye from Freddie Gilroy. That was patched up. Now it's Johnny Caldwell with a badly cut eye. And as I said, towards the end of that last round, both boys were covered with blood. And Johnny Caldwell's eye has gone again. He can still throw a punch. And one minute, one minute. they are both like red skins, literally. One minute still to go through this round, and Johnny Caldwell with blood flowing practically. Yes, flowing out of his eye now. He must stop this. The referee must stop this. a minute to go but can Caldwell oh and a blow from Freddie Gilroy to the face of Caldwell this fight must be stopped and only a few seconds left and you could hardly recognize these boys as boys their gloves are covered and well there it is the end of the ninth round Johnny Caldwell with a very badly cut eye and look at his boy Caldwell and say that will not go on and Andy Smith the referee goes over to the Gilroy and has declared him the winner so Freddie Gilroy Empire and British bantamweight champion has retained his titles
how did you feel about uh, when Freddie announced his retirement after the fight? I mean, well, he, well, he see, went out with his principles intact. I see what it was. See, now that after the fight, Salomon said to Freddie, "Will you give her a torn fight?" He says, "I right, but I want more money." Right. And Salomon says, "I couldn't give him more from the king's own bond." Yeah. I couldn't give him any I'm more money. So, um, you know, I'm playing for a senior, which is probably a bad idea. Mum plays the pace up. No, can't do it. And he says, uh, so that, uh, that, that, so what, uh, Cal was next, that was a contender for the, the fight fairy. Right. And they went, went to the post office. Right. right. And, uh, Freddy says, so the post office went, Mac and Ray went to Keenan and said, will you go for this fight here? He said, we couldn't out, out that bid. Solomon. So I never went for it. Solomon bid. Five thousand for the fight for the two of them. Right. Freddie when he fought Cal and fought, Freddie got six thousand. Right. And we John got a thousand. So we had one that fought about him forty, fifty, Freddie we got three thousand. And uh we John got two thousand. Yeah. Freddie said I'm not fighting for that three thousand fat down. When that time was bung you can get six six thousand. Right. So he said, no, I'm not fighting. Not that not good enough money. So the boxing board control sent board said if you don't fight, we'll find a thousand pound. So Freddie said, I'm fine, no thousand pounds, I'm retired. Right. He, well, he, I he thought... He retired when he's 20, 26. And he never lost his titles in the ring. The bronze medal. That's the Olympic bronze medal. See, money can't buy that. And they're priceless. And they're priceless. Three, three, uh, competition. That's it. Olympic bronze medal there, from Melbourne. Uh, yeah. Look at that. Should wow. have been a gold. Should have been a gold. <laughs> that was a robbery. Hey, you, you, did you knock the Russian out, didn't you? The favoured? Did you knock him out or did you beat him in points? Uh, Early in the competition? Oh he yeah. was a favoured to win it. Uh, and there's Freddie in his prime. Barry, uh, what's your experience of boxers from Ardoin and the bone? Top quality kids. It always have been right back to f as far back as I can remember. Um, the standard of coaching. Uh, there's a great populace there, a lot of working class kids coming through the door and they've, they've you know, you will know the, the, the detail on, on, on all the kids but they've produced incredible fighters over the, over the generations. It's a hard, tough area. Uh, did you ever box anybody or spar anybody from Ardoin? Yeah, yeah, sparred you <laughs> uh, yeah. many's the time, and uh, well, not many's the time, but sparred you uh, enough to know that um, you know you were a great talent. You just didn't get the breaks that you deserved. You actually you hit me off the bell. Did I hit yeah, you off the bell? Yeah. But you Thank God you <laughs> weighed 18 ounce gloves on. But the likes of Freddie Gilroy and, and boys like that are from Ardoin, uh, Paddy Barnes, uh, yeah. you, surely you would have a high opinion on them boys. Uh, Paddy Barnes, uh, who's the other one? Freddie Gilroy. Oh, Freddie Gilroy, what a, what a talent he was, and, and, and Barnes, of course. Well, let's start with Gilroy. Gilroy was, was um, arguably one of the best amateurs that uh, Ireland ever had. Very badly uh, robbed in the Olympic semi-finals against Wolfgang Berend from East Germany. Um, and sh should have went on to win the gold medal. Berend won the gold medal. An in interesting little fact, I fought his son... In, uh, in in East Germany in 1979 uh, called Mario, son called Mario, very, very talented guy too. Um, so that Freddie then went on as a pro to, uh, uh, you know, to fight for the European title. Uh, he was a t tremendous kid, uh, British, British a tremendous Empire. fighter, British yeah. Empire champion, big puncher, uh, smart, uh, smart fighter, um, could really wallop. Uh, a great admiration. One of the guys I sort of grew up admiring. Paddy Barnes, on the other hand, multi-talented. Um, don't think he'll ever turn pro. Yeah, he's broke the record for Irish boxing. Most team. successful amateur yeah, ever. Most successful Ireland. amateur uh, boxer ever came out. Two, two Olympic bronze medals, uh, Commonwealth gold, European gold. Um, hugely talented. Uh, very unfortunate. He's only a light flyweight, but. Um, uh, yeah, what a talent and a great guy and a stand-up comic to boot. Yeah, big Darren Corbett. Darren, Cor Darren Corbett again. Darren never really yeah. hit the dizzy heights, but tremendous puncher, natural power. Could have been world class. Could have been a world champion at cruiserweight yeah. had he got the breaks. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're only to, to mention a few. Our downs full of talented kids, and also we have um, we have. Um, uh, we have uh, the, the Oliver Plunkett Club and, and Patsy Quinn, who's produced so many great fighters over the years as well. So much talent.
I'm with uh, Barney Burns' brother, Pat. Uh, Pat, uh, where did you just live in the bone? Hartree Street, number 39. Right. And Barney started his boxing. Did he start with a crown? Yeah, he started with a crown club. Talk to me about that. Well, I think he was about 15 or 16 when he started. He worked in Harry's Bonton in Warren Street. And then he went on to... He joined the boxing club in the Crown Entry. Good and, club. Uh, he joined along with Anthony McGuire. And they both joined that club and won Ulster titles and Harry's titles. Adam McLean, he was at the, the Crown too. Yeah, a, it was a great club. Paddy uh, McGuire was there for a wee while. Uh, Arthur Anderson was their trainer. So and, uh, he, he won many titles for that club? He won uh, two Ulster and three... Harry's senior titles. Then he moved over to Birmingham. Box for Small Heath. And he won two more yeah. Harry's senior titles. Well, I think he won an Ulster and an Harry's senior title coming back from Birmingham to defend us. Yeah. His titles. Yeah. No, he's then definitely he, in the record books now as one of three senior titles. I've seen that. Yeah. And then he, he fought. Uh, Chris Finnegan and uh, Sammy Finn was the ABS first year and Finnegan beat him and then he fought Finnegan three or two times against England Ireland against England wow. and then he got beat in the final of the ABS by a fellow called McCann Terry McCann that's Terry right McCann. yeah it was a close fight and he'd about 17 international fights for Ireland. I think he fought, oh, he fought around about that now. I think he went to the European Championships yeah. too. Yeah. And uh, he fought Bunny Johnson. He fought Bunny Johnson. He beat Bunny Johnson and Bunny Johnson's last amateur fight. Well, tell us who Bunny Johnson was. Bunny Johnson was the first black British heavyweight champion. Uh, but I'm very excited about Barney. Uh, I didn't really know an awful lot about him, but no doubt his, his accomplishments I put him well up there with, with the greats oh, to come out well, of like Belfast. He boxed, he boxed a lot of fights for Ulster as well, you know, in the Ulster teams and him and uh, Jim McCourt, Turkington Brothers, Hayden Christie, all them, uh, Charlie Rice. Boxed along with Paddy Fitzsimmons and all that. Right, oh, he's in good company. Did you ever box yourself, Pat? I did. Box for Small Heath. Right. Not many fights, only about seven. Right. There you are. How long did you live in Birmingham for? I lived there for about 18 months. Bernard right. and I shared a, a room together, board together in the building site. Right. Thanks very much for speaking to me, Pat. Okay. Really? Uh, Sean, talk to me about your memories of Barney Bunch. Well, first of all, Barney, number one, good, a great, a great man, may he rest in peace, and I've never known him to have a cross word with anyone, all the days that I did knew him, but it was a hell of a long time, he and Big Anthony, Anthony McGuire were very close friends, came to the club together, sometimes they even came along with him. The club then was a crown, crown boxing club. Uh, Arthur Anderson was the main coach, helped by Sturdy Campbell. But Barney's exploits were second to none, as then um, he had three back-to-back -back fights with a guy called Craig from Derry. I think he may have been in a, one of the bases up there or something like that, but there were, there were absolute and total wars. Barney never lost one. But anyway, to come, to come, to rush through, a lad, and get the, the day that we Arthur Onyx was told Barney was leaving for England. This was after he won an Irish senior title This is after crowd. he won an Irish senior title for us. Arthur asked me to go up to his house and tell him he wasn't going. And Arthur's word was law at all times. So I got up to the house and called over Barney's girlfriend. His mother were in tears. I said to me, Sean, 
he's just left. If you're right, you may catch him. I felt my job was done. I went back down into the crown. Said Arthur, Arthur's gone. Arthur looked at the watch. Said, son, that boat doesn't go to 10 o'clock. Get down that. Get down, look around. See if you can find him. I looked at it. You've done what you were told. Even if it was, I think it was 21, maybe 22. Went down, I looked around everywhere. I looked. And I'm sure if Barney, if Barney was hiding behind something, he would have stayed there because he would have known why he was there. The message boy for, for the boss. He know. must have been very special for you to go to all that trouble. Very special, very special in every way, but yeah. very special guy, very special manners, very special, as I said, absolutely and totally every way. And a model. If you were wanting your kids to show them how to train, the tigger is skipping, nothing fancy, but everything perfection. And that the knees are up in the stomach for the whole three minutes. Like, that was like a, a pair of scissors operating. Eamon, uh, talk to me about uh, your brother, Anthony McGuire. He boxed for the crown, didn't he? Yeah, well, he, he boxed for the crown and he boxed for the cigarette heart. He won a senior title up in the Sacred Heart. He won a Irish senior title. I think it was the late sixties. Uh the late sixties, uh. Right. Well, the Sacred Heart only opened in '63. Right. It's the first one to box for him. Did he? Did he always box for the Crown? Uh, did he start off boxing? He started or? off the Crown. Uh, he, he. I only didn't box till he was uh, twenty. He never started. He didn't never trained as a kid or anything. He always done with. Weightlifting, he was a big right. old man, he always done weights. He never uh, really had any interest in boxing. But he started down the ground with Barney Barnes and Chris, his cousin Chris Magley. So Chris had won a nice title as well. Senior title? No, no, no. it was a juvenile. Right. He won, he, he, Chris fought uh, Henry Torkington, the fan of the uh, Ulster Seniors, I think. Right. He beat Bully Torkington. Uh huh. And I think Henry beat him. One way or the other, I forget where it was Henry won or Willie won, but he beat one of them anyway. Did you all follow Anthony into the boxing? Did you join the crown? Because no. I know your brother Paddy boxed and, and you no, boxed. No, no, Evans boxed for the crown. Anthony was the only one boxed for the crown. And then he boxed for the Sacred Heart. Right. And uh, did he box for his country, do you know, Anthony? He did, I. Well, you are. Boxed against Germany. Wow. But Tommy, Tommy, Paddy, Tommy. And Paddy boxed for the Holy Family when it was over on the big house on the Antrim Road. And Joe boxed for Sacred Heart. Joe boxed for the Bosco as well. And Paddy boxed for Paddy and Tommy. But the only one out of the higher house that didn't box was Robbie, right. the oldest brother. Right. Barber. He would have talked his way or anything anyway. Uh huh. The fight. And uh, tell me a wee bit about your own boxing career. Very short. Boxing career was right. Me, Jerry Smith opened it. It was his first trainer in the Sacred Heart, and uh, first year he ba I boxed one of the county Andrums. Got beat by a guy called Ken Craig in the in the juniors. Ken Craig, who was actually a Imperial Services champion, shouldn't have been boxing in the juniors. He was also twenty six years of age. He was a Navy man, an English man. Come over and he had fought in the ABAs. He fought in an ABA final. And come over here and box for the army or the navy, I forget what he was in. But anyway, that was. And then Jerry Smith, who was the trainer in the Sacred Heart, jacked up the boxing. Left his wife wasn't up well, and he left the boxing altogether. He packed it up. And another guy, Mickey Fern, took over training the club, and maybe he hadn't much experience of training in the club. <coughs> Just one of the pieces in. So the club actually folded. And about. Five years later, uh, he started training the club. Then Eric McCulloch and Anthony started boxing to him. He won the Irish Seniors and the Ulsters and stuff. And boxed for his country. And boxed for Ireland. And you know Barney Burns got the final of the ABAs too. I was at and the so did Eamon McCauley. I was at it. Uh, you were at the final. Yeah. Terry McCann was beat him, wasn't it? Was hey? Terry McCann. Terry McCann, that's right. Uh, yeah, and then he got beaten in the semi-final by Chris Finnegan. Chris Finnegan beat him in the semi-finals. No, it was the fans we were at. It was me and Mickey Coogan. Terry McCann. Wow. Me and Mickey Coogan were working in London at the time. 
Two and years. Worked at and Wembley. Wow. And uh, I got very upset about Barney getting bit. Right, was it close? It was, uh, it was a good fight. It was, uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm near sure it was a majority of the season. It was a close fight anyway. Wow, I didn't know that. And Barney was Barney Steve King's Irish senior Small champion. Heath. What? Small Heath in Birmingham, that's yeah, correct. Barney and Kintan in Birmingham. He won his first Irish title with a crown. That's right. And then he won two more with Small Heath. That's right. And you also know he was the last boxer. Remember Bunny Johnson, the first black heavyweight champion? Uh, Barney was a, Barney beat Bunny John, Johnson in his last fight, a last amateur fight. Was that right? Aye, uh, in Birmingham. Yeah. Oh, also went to the European Championships, Barney Burns. He what? Went to the European Championships and boxed 17 times for his country. Oh, no, he boxed a lot for Ireland. Uh, One of the greats. He was a, <coughs> before I even started boxing, I used to go do road work with Barney. Me and Barney were sort of good friends then. And then he went to England after and became the... And when we went to his cousin, I went to England with his cousin, Mickey. Mickey Coogan, God rest him. <coughs> and we went to watch Barney fighting Wally Stack. And the fan, Wally Stack beat him. Right. And on the way back from the fights, Mickey kicked about 13 of them, rode up signs, you know, the red lights in the street. Aye. He kicked all them in the trench. And a tramp, he's dead now, he can't be done for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the McGee, talk to me about the McGee brothers. <coughs> well, Terry was the first one I got but, uh, an Irish title from. And then Noel and Patrick and Eamon. Did Patrick win on that Irish title? Patrick was always in the early man. He had a great pair of hands, Patrick. Yeah. Him, he, he just, yeah. He had a bad chest all the time, Patrick. He, he never really was. He was fit. very attractive on the eye. Was he was well, lovely, he smooth boxer, boxer, boxer lovely beautiful boxer, to watch, but great operator. But uh, he lost twice to Eddie Fisher in very very tight fights. Right, no, no, one of them fights was Patrick and one like. Uh huh. But uh, but there's three brothers thing. from Ardoin, Noel, Terry, and Eamon fought uh, for the European professional title. Uh, yeah, That's yeah. some achievement, like. Oh, good lads, and right. Noel beat Stevie Collins. You'd have been in his corner. That's right, no. What do you remember about them fights? 1985 think, senior final. Down in Dublin, uh, and with the trouble getting digs, we were arsed about getting digs, and uh, it wasn't a great, uh, it wasn't a great smooth transition from going down to Dublin to fight, and even our, our Noel couldn't get a digs before. I finished, I finished up staying with friends. We couldn't get digs in Dublin anyway, and it was a bit upsetting, like, but. That's who he beat in the final, Stevie Collins. Yeah. I, mean, I think the fought as professionals, didn't they? No, no, they fought twice as amateurs. Noel beat him twice. Did they not? Did no, they not no, Sam Story box, Steve Collins as a professional. I thought that Noel had fought him. No, definitely not, no. no. I know, I, the, now the second fight, uh, Collins was all up for, he thought he was going to right. hammer him, but it didn't work out for him. Right. <laughs> Eamon, uh, just before uh, I terminate this, huh? uh, you boxed my dad, didn't you? Trained with him on a sparring room. Never yeah, boxed. Daddy said he beat you when you were 10, but you <laughs> said to me you were robbed. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> my dad won a few Irish titles. Aye, but we never boxed him. And I, I fought him in, in the, the hut at the bottom of. Uh, what street was that? Butler Street? The Star, the old, yeah, the Star. The old, uh, it was the old St. Gabriel's Boxing Club. Yeah, yeah. Charlie McCauley oh, and Ernie yeah. Reagan. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and. But I remember saying to you 30 years ago, mm. at least 30 years ago, my dad claims that he beat you, and quick as a flash, you says, oh, but I was robbed. So you must have, oh, you must have boxed him, you must have. You said it was a majority. <laughs> 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 Every, my dad never gets no credit, honestly. Yes, and you. He oh, was no. the only Maguire that didn't box, but yeah. he could talk his way out of a fight. He didn't need to box or fight. Oh, Rob is a great character. Well, it's a bit easier in the face if you can talk your way out of it. I'm here at the home of uh, Freddie Gilroy's brother, Teddy. Uh, I've been directed to Teddy's house. I was told Teddy's an authority 
on local boxers. Um, Teddy, uh, I'm very interested in Shawnee Brown and he's a Norfolk Drive man like yourself. Could you tell me a few things about Shawnee? Well, the only thing, you know, he joined the Boston Club at the same time as Freddie when they were young. I think about six of them that time and Fred and Sean was awesome was a stick to it. So he won on the win, I think he won the Ulster title. I know he won the All Ireland, in fact, it was one of the best fights I've seen down, down in the, the stadium. I think he fought the Mount Sweeney. He was brilliant that night. Right, that was at Late Walter, right? Yep, that uh, But no, he didn't win the Ulster Seniors. His name's, Ulster his name's not in the record books. But certainly in 1815. Yeah, he fought with John Colwell when he was young. Did he? He fought Colwell, yes. Wow. And some Murray's. Right, that's very interesting. Uh, did he box international? Did he box for Ireland? He got, I think he got a representative for Ireland. Yeah, they, they, they went to Africa. And that's where he represented Ireland, the African tour, so he was. Uh, Hugo, uh, Shawnee Brown uh, and uh, John Kelly, I'm very interested in uh, their boxing careers. Uh, can you speak, do you know anything about, about their boxing careers? Well, only what I heard actually, I'm going to tell you the truth, is actually through what we call the Boyce Telegraph, word of mouth passing through the area. When I was young, they were a few years older than me. So I didn't, uh, I wasn't interested in boxing, but all I could pick up was wee bits of gossip here and wee bits across my ear. But both of them were very well adversed in their trade of boxing. They were very well respected, I think. Both of them had, I don't know, our manifest, but both of them had fought for Ireland. Right. Three times. Uh, you could put in folklore. No, this is folklore, it's not truth. Yeah. Randy Mulligan or one of them was supposed to have said that Johnny Brown had one of the best educated hands you'd seen in boxing. Wow. Uh, the legendary Randy Mulligan was yeah. alleged to have said uh, that. But that's folklore. You would have to sort of. Delve like deeper that. and investigate that. See, yeah, that's true. Uh, what a compliment! Big John was just a, a heavyweight boxer, punch very, very. He won his fights. I ain't more be his punch, and he wouldn't be a I can tell you something. But John himself told me now when he was working for me as a caretaker in the youth club, he had said to me that he says the reason he gave up heavyweight boxing, most heavyweights give or take around about that time. They were all big, tall blokes, six foot, six foot two, you know, from Poland and Russia and yeah. Europe. John wasn't. John was only five foot odds. So John says that, but I can hit, punch better than that. Yeah. And what I had to do was to get in to land that punch. But the punishment he was taking to right. get in was too much. So he decided he would pack it. It wasn't worth it. Well, that's very interesting. Well, John, uh, the highlight of John's career, he was. Uh, 1957 Ulster Senior Heavyweight Champion yeah. and Shawnee Brown, the pinnacle of his career was in 1959 he was Irish Senior Champion yeah. and he actually toured South Africa with an Ireland team. Yeah. I'm not sure if John boxed for Ireland but he certainly boxed well, for he Ulster. Told me he well, he well he did then because I mean w what a lovely man, he wouldn't tell lies. No, he's a gentleman. Gentleman, <laughs> him and Shawnee Brown, two yeah. absolute gentlemen. Two, uh, really what you would call Monuments to put up for young people taking up boxing. You know, that way they role models. Role models. That's Brilliant. Him in your yeah. And what 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 they big in their day? The fact that John Kelly and Sean Brown were representing Ireland at international level was that big news here in our town. Well, 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 really looked up to or revered. No, and it, I'll tell you why. We hadn't got the communication skills that we have now. Television. No news, but a flood. But if you weren't as in boxing, you wouldn't have read. Because unless you read the paper. Right. Do that way. Because boxing was van with football, it was van with other sports, so, and with no advertising anymore. No television, really, yeah, even no, no television. Yeah. No, no communicating the sport yeah. out to the parish. There, there would have been no one. Like, you had to be really big time like Garoy. Aye. Do that way. Yeah. Sort of to get the news and the other cars, but the normal amateur boxers would have, within the boxing circles, would have been well known. Like I was 14, probably maybe 15 at, at the oldest in 1957, because I was born 43. Yeah. So it was either 14, 43, aye, I would have been 
and 57 out of 14. Uh, and you'd have been mates with John's, Joe, 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 John's John Kelly, younger brother? John's younger brother. It was John uh -huh. and then Shimmy. It was Daylight. Daylight. And then Joe and then Tommy. All characters too. Oh, especially Shimmy. Daylight? No, oh, he's, he's a legend. Uh, people don't need to do your comments, Jimmy. Right. Some people do. But anyhow, you get back to the fight. Getting back to you, you're one of the only men I can find. In fact, yeah, you're the only man I can find that, that's seen John Kelly boxing. Yes. So right, talk so to me about that. This is it. I mean, I'm trying to get back to think of the night my father took Joe and I down to the Ulster Hall. I'm hoping it was the Ulster Hall, because it was either St Mary's Hall or the Ulster Hall, but I think the championships were held in the Ulster Hall in 1957. I used to go to see the championships in St Mary's Hall at one time. Don't know why they were on from championships or Ulster championships. But getting back to John, John wasn't the greatest boxer in the world, but by God, he could punch. Big, big man, John Kelly. And why I wanted to see Pat McCrory was to find out did he win on that knockout, which he usually did, or did he win on points? But I think it was a knockout. But when you're saying he was a big man, he wasn't really tall. He, he, wasn't was, tall. Big, he was huge he was, in stature, he was yeah. He massive was a shoulders and yeah, yeah. Ma massive all over was uh -huh. John. So he used to take two or three to get in to, to land his one. You know, but when he landed right. his one. Oh, that was it. That was good night. And what do you remember okay. about that night? Well, you're well, you're course, not sure. We you were only 14. I was only 14. You're not sure if it was a stoppage or points. Exactly, exactly. I'm not too sure. But John won most of his fights by knockout. Stop each technical knockout or whatever you like to call it, because, like I say, he wasn't the greatest boxer in the world. Lovely fella, John Kelly. Wasn't the most scientific he boxer. He was not him, I and mean, he was not brute force and ignorance. He could punch. He right. could punch, and he won the RUC Cup for the that time at the. It was, I think the the change it round one year. It's for heavyweights. Maybe the next year, welterweights. Bantam weights, I don't know, because my son in law won the same cup. Pat Tenney. Pat Tenney, but anyhow, getting back to John, John won the RUC Cup and we were over the moon. But basically, the fight, it was exciting, and of course, it was the last fight of the night. The heavyweights. Yeah. So, uh, well, we had a good old time. But what you, know? you said to me earlier was what you remember, it's tattooed in your brain, was a big pair of shorts. Oh, no, that's a. They, that, that, that's. That's letting Joe, God rest John, letting him down. He had a pair of shorts that both Joe and I could have got into. Because <laughs> John, John wasn't actually the slimmest fella in the world. And uh, he just used to shuffle around, him and just shuffled around and then bang. Yes. But we wow. watched John fighting. He fought for the Bosco. He fought for the St John Bosco. Yeah, and two uh, years later, Shawnee Brown won the, the Irish. Uh, senior uh, Lee Welder with a title, he boxed for St John Bosco. He did indeed. Ardoin so, man, Norfolk right. Drive man. Did, right. Do you remember Sean boxing? I do not. No. I think I saw, I saw Sean once. Right. But I can't even remember because I remember Sean e. Brown and his brothers more than I knew Sean. Right. right. But getting back to John Kelly, John before, Kelly, before we move off from John Kelly, Hugo McGee said Hugo got to know him very, very well when he was a caretaker right. of the Ardoin Youth Club. Yes. But Hugo says even in his 60s, John Kelly was lifting phenomenal weights. Phenomenal. His strength right. was incredible. That's right. He used, to, he used to lift the weights along with the, the McAfee. Ronnie Whiteway and uh, the McAfee. There was a McAfee's out of Brompton Park, and he was a great friend of Billy... Brom Park as well. Some Stevenson, great, Billy Stevenson, Stevenson. Billy Stevenson. They all were under the weights where John was in the boxing, you know. Yeah, Billy some great characters in Brompton Park. Oh, you name it. It was a great place to grow up in. It was, without right. a doubt. Your daddy was down the bottom of the street. Right, we beside the Whelans. He right. was down near the Whelans, that's right. But you live near John, near John's John family? Was, we were in 24, John was in 36. He lived about six doors below us. Right. My aunt and uncle lived two doors above him. We right. lived four doors above that. So did, did you know the Kilhoolies from Haybury? Did knew Charlie. Charlie went to school with me. I went to school with Charlie. Charlie went to school with me. The two of us were in the one class. But I remember Charlie boxing as a, a young fella, maybe 10, 11 years of age, 10, 9. He went the Antrim. Probably Good, Great schoolboy, yeah. Beat great, my great schoolboy yeah. boxer. He used to bring the medals mm -hmm. and the cups into school to to show them right. and I and I hadn't seen Charlie for years and I met him up in Antrim about two years ago Right. and uh, 
Is he doing well? Doing great. Doing great, Eamon. And Big Hugh's doing well. Big Hugh still Hugh, does Hugh's the door for Aiken. Yeah, yeah. Now, Hugh was twice Ulster senior champion. Hugh was a character. Still is. Right. Uh, he's about 75 now and he's still doing is the door. Right? Oh, he's, he is. He's older than Charlie, of course. But uh, Charlie's quiet. And he always was quiet. I never even, you know, you wouldn't have took him for a boxer. Right. He was always quiet, even in school. You know, he would never get into any mischief or anything. And what about Jim? Did you know Jim? Oh, well, I know Jim, all right, but did Jim box? Jim lost an eye, you see, he got he hit did. with a bow and arrow. Davey, uh, you had your first fight up in St Gabriel's, didn't you? I won my first uh, Ulster title in St Gabriel's 1964. I beat Tommy Lockhart from Ballymena. I also fought in Ardoyne twice in the Crumlin Star Club. I fought Paddy Aspel from Dublin, a good friend of mine, beat him. And I fought Lasik Biskinski, uh, Pole, uh, bronze medals at the Munich and the Montreal Olympics. I uh, beat him in the star. Right. You said to me there was some tough boys come out of Ardoin. Can you remember uh, anyone? Yeah, I sparred... Uh, Peter McKenna. Peter came from uh, Ardoin. I sparred him in the Holy Family Club. Peter with a ginger hair? Yeah, correct. Right. In those days, I went anywhere for a fight and anywhere for a spar. And I usually end up in different clubs sparring, sometimes people heavier myself. Uh, in Ardoin, a friend of mine, right up until his death, was uh, Martin Mayne. Met Martin the last time I seen him. That's with right. Him. Two years before Martin the, done a bit of boxing too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think boxers from Ardoin have been overshadowed by Freddie, probably Freddie Galloway. Uh, but there were and there are some hard men in Ardoin. Uh, I'm up here in Palomino, I'm with one of the legends of Irish boxing, uh, Jerry Hamill. Jerry won a gold medal at the 1978 Commonwealth Games in Edmonton and also went to the 1976 Montreal Olympics. Uh, Jerry, uh, you fought some Ardoin boxers, didn't you? Did, yeah. Talk to me about that. Uh, the Ardoin man that, that I remember is uh, Blackie Megan was one of them. Yeah, I Jackie, boxed, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jackie. I, I boxed Jackie on, on four occasions. Uh, and I, I, I had three wins and one, one defeat against Jackie. Uh, I boxed another guy. Who did uh, Jackie represent? Bosco, John Bosco. Bosco, because we hadn't got a club in Ardoin. No, then, but that's right. Well, at that time, Megan, the first time I fought Megan, he, he was Irish champion and uh, supposed to be the best Irish juvenile of, of, of that time and that era. Uh, and I beat him in the Ulster Championships and went down to Dublin. And because he was Irish champion, I fought him again in the Irish finals and beat him again in the Irish finals. I think when we fought again the following year, uh, where, where he beat me. Uh, well, he beat me. I was disqualified, believe it or believe it or not. For there was pull on, pull on gloves at the time, and uh, I had some disagreement with the referee, and I threw the gloves away, uh, and he, he disqualified me. But because I was Irish champion then, I went back down to Dublin, and we met again. I think it was the semi finals we met, and I beat I beat Jackie again in the in the semi finals, and we won the win the Irish title again. Uh, the other guy I boxed was, uh, if I can remember, his his father was a was a was a coach for for St Gabriel's, Charlie McCauley. Charlie McCauley, yeah, and I think it was a Pat McCauley boxed from from St Gabriel's. Right. Uh, strong, durable, stand up boxer, uh, Pat. Uh, would have beat him in the, uh, the Ulsters or else the, the, the Down and Connors. Was it just the once you just fought? Just the once you fought, yeah. And then I went up and... Uh, and where was it? Where did you fight? I think it was in, in uh, the school hall. In, in, St Gabriel's? In St Gabriel's, yeah. And, uh, but I went up and I would have done a bit of sparring as I got into, into uh, junior grade with Charlie McWinney. Uh, so me and Charlie would have, been, would have been buddies for a while. Charlie came down and the, the, the Holy Family, I think, and, and joined the Holy Family for a while.
The McAlinden Cup then at stake in this day light heavyweight final. And the red vest and the white trunks, it's last year's runners up. Last year's runner up, Noel McGee from the Sacred Heart Club. And his opponent, the 1983 middleweight champion, Tony Curry from the famous St. Agnes's Club. Curry's nose has bled almost non-stop from the start of this contest. And that, I think, a tribute to the crisp and accurate punching of Noel McGee, who's boxing quite beautifully, and that was a beautiful right hand. And Tony Curry, I think, is not all that happy. His corner has thrown the tile in, and I think that'll be it. He staggered, and that's it. And no doubt about it. No doubt about it. As comprehensive a victory as you could possibly wish for. Tony Curry grins, a gallant Tony Curry, but he really was outclassed. And with uh, Steve Collins, the Celtic warrior, uh, Steve won world titles in two different weight divisions, and he made seven defences of his world super middleweight title. He is the most successful boxer ever to come out of Ireland. But a wee lad from Ardoin called Noel McGee beat him, not once, but twice. Do you remember him fight, Steve? Yeah, um, I think a couple of guys from Ardoin beat me. He was, he was one of them, yeah. 1984 Ari Senior final. Mm. There's two minutes of it on YouTube. Uh, very tight decision. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> no. Is this, is this selective amnesia, Steve? No, I Because if you'd have won them, you'd have remembered them. Um, I don't even remember the ones I won. I had to. Uh, I, I remember as a pro. Um, no, 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 I was a big, strong, powerful man, and, and uh, I sparred him, and we used to spar up in Eastwoods, and, and um, I suppose I looked at him and thought, how the hell did I fight this guy? This guy, he's, he's a big lump, he's, he's tall, he's broad, he's very heavy boned, and, and uh, powerful. I mean, he fought cruiserweight, he didn't like heavyweight, as a pro. He, he, he boxed a late heavyweight, he ended his career cruiserweight yeah, fighting Don Corbett. Big guy, big, strong, powerful man, and, and um, yeah, I've, I've nothing but uh, positive memories of him. I mean, there was a terrific crew, up in the Eastwood gym at that time, and Noel definitely was, was part of it, yeah. And he was based up in the UK for a while, and he was with a guy called Bernard Brogan for some time. Pat Brogan, from Stoke. Bernard Brogan was in the Gaelic pair, Pat Brogan, yes, that's right. And of course, Terry, Terry boxed for Fice No 2. Yeah, Terry, Terry, Terry was based in Ireland for the Wales. I honestly thought Terry was the better fighter of the two. Um, as amateur, I thought he would have made it better, you know, would have been progress forward as a pro than Noel, but then you just don't know. And right. I know Terry was better than does Terry live in Wales now? Is he based in Wales or is he back in He still lives in Wales. Yeah, I mean, he's, out, he's over there a long time He's now. been away there since 1980 or 81. Yeah. But you, you boxed Terry, you said. When did you box him in the youth? I, I think it was, um, yeah. I think, yeah, because yeah, Terry was a smash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and you beat him? Yeah, I, well, I won the Irish shoot, so I think yeah, it was Terry who fought in the finals, yeah. Right, right. It must have been an off day for Terry. He's a very good fighter. Right. I started boxing. I guess I would have been 14. And I went to England in 1982 at 16. And that's when I really came to the fore. I won two British junior titles. And we travelled all over the country, boxed everywhere Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, Coventry, Southampton, London. I was picked four or five times to box for my country. And the pinnacle of my amateur career. Probably would have been winning the ABA Championships in 1985. And the irony was, I got a paratrooper in the final. Member of the Parachute Regiment, the same regiment that had inflicted so much pain on my community. And with my dad being well known for fighting and beating members of the Parachute Regiment, it put me under an awful lot of pressure. If I had a loss, people would have cast it up to me. People would have reminded me, she let that para beat you. So, he had his own reasons for winning. As I say, I think he served over here. His name was Kyle Crook. And um, we put on a great final. I knocked him out in the second round, broke his nose in three places. And he went on to become British professional champion. Won the long seal belt, outright in record time. I think he defended four or five times his British title. He fought twice for the European title. And was number five late in the world. Uh, me, I packed it in and I think it was a month short of my 22nd birthday. Turn professional with Barney Eastwood, I won 12 out of 13 professional fights, I think it was 12 out of 13 professional fights. And as I say, I retired a month short of my 22nd birthday. 
Crook now just beginning to get on top with much sharper, more accurate punching with the left hand. Oh, as I say that, so he takes two to the mouth, out comes his gum shield, and up comes the standing count. I do have a way of bringing these things on. Gum shield returned to the corner for washing. And Crook is perfectly all right. Second round. So that's the first real shock of this final at lightweight. With two very good punches from McCauley. First thing he's really done. And suddenly Crook was in a bit of trouble. And McCauley now showing considerable strength inside. And Crook's edge has completely disappeared. Good little uppercut there from McCauley again. Eamon McCauley from the Hogarth Club in West London. And now it's Crook's turn to come back, a left hook. So they've had a counter piece now in this second round. Some round. Come round. Oh. Closing seconds of the second, he's caught McCauley again. Oh, and he's got Crook! Now it's gone the other way, would you believe it? Oh, Crook walked right on to an almighty punch. And he stopped, it's all over. One moment he seemed to have it in the bag, and the next moment McCauley, who's on his knees, is the ABA champion, and he cannot understand it. And he's led back to his corner by the referee, as you can see, badly hurt, damaged to the nose, and what a remarkable finish that was. Here we go again. This was absolutely out of the blue again. McCauley seemed to be on his way to defeat, and then suddenly, he produced a punch, oh, a right hand. And with uh, former world featherweight champion, WBC, also British and European champion, Paul Hoko Hodginson, I've been told in very good authority by Scousers, by Dave Kenny and quite a few others, that you picked Carl Crook to beat me in the 1985 ABA final. <laughs> now, take it in the chin, to tell the truth. Do, do, I, can't know. Remember, you know, I can't remember, you know, I can't remember the fight, but... Uh, but I remember watching the fight, and uh, I think I think uh, I don't know whether Carl was 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 ahead at the time. Yeah, he then, was. Yeah. And uh, then you come up with this big right hands. Yeah. Bam. And I mean, Carl, Carl's, um, Carl was in the training squad, but he's got was a nice lad. He was, he was a good little fighter. But so was Aim McCauley. Aim was Broke his nose in three places. Yeah. And I'm barred from them three places. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good to be back in what do I mean? with <laughs> Aim McCauley. I'm up at the halfway house here in the Larne Coast. Uh, I'm with former British flyweight champion and IBF world flyweight champion Dave Boy McCauley. Uh, Davey, uh, what is your experience uh, uh, of Ardoin boxers? None. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, but Ardoin a great reputation for producing hard, tough men. Right. And uh, Eamon McGee. Yep, yeah, tough guy. No McGee, tough guy. Darren Corbett, a tough guy. Listen, anybody who puts a pair of gloves on is tough. <laughs> Listen, you know, that's the way I've had it. If you're putting gloves on and you're getting in the ring, they're sparring a the fight that you're tough, you know. But if you're softies involved in boxing. Were you ever in our line? Once. Maybe. Right, uh, I'm going to tell you. Uh, once. I once. Me, <coughs> me and Tony McNulty called up for you and Paul Hodginson one night in Gene, Gene Alexander's house in Bangor. And we brought you down the Ardoin, brought you to the McNulty house. And what I always remember about that night was that you took four sugars in your tea. That's tattooed in my brain. Do you not remember that night? Uh, no, but I uh, know. Uh, Farrington Gardens. Uh, I don't. I don't take so much sugar now, Nick. But uh, uh, but I take sometimes five. Depending right. on the size of the cup. <laughs> you know, if you give me a mug. You like a wee drop of tea in your sugar? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't take so much sugar now. I don't. Like I watched all those boys that I, that I train with, like uh, Big Lo, Big Lo McGee, yeah, yeah, and he's the sort of guy you could hit Big Lo on, like tough, tough, tough. And Darren Corbett, he's another tough guy. I mean, and they can, like for some reason, 
they are, they are, they are, they are doing clubs. They always seem to be able to punch because McGee get punch. You get punch yourself because, as I know, because you used to put me down the other time. <laughs> used to hit me when I wasn't looking. Well, you said two diabolical liberties. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, anybody that I know from the are doing clubs, they're tough guys. Like, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they all come bang a bit. You know, they give the corbis, you, but you yourself. You have the McGee's, you know, and, and there's quite a few others. He, Freddie Gilroy. Freddie Gilroy. He, he could bang a wee bit. Right, and like, he, he was a, a tough, tough, tough customer. But look, see anybody who dons a pair of gloves, regardless of, of what club they're fighting for, anybody who dons a pair of gloves, you know, it's tough. But especially from up and around the yard down there. They must wear, must wear, they must wear. Uh, make them tough up there. Uh, they, they must put something under gloves, do they? Because I'm, I'm sure you're the horseshoe you're going to get me. <laughs> okay, you've been very successful in your boxing career. As an amateur, you won a World Junior Silver in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 1989. You were twice Irish Senior Champion. And in actual fact, you had a great chance of going to the Olympic Games because you were Irish Senior Champion that year. And the IABA, in their infinite wisdom, wanted you to box off against Neil Goff, who you had already beat. But on a point of principle, you refused to do so, and the Ulster Boxing Council vowed to put a fight to your corner. But it never came to anything, and so with it went your chance of going to the Olympic Games, which is the pinnacle of every amateur's career. Does it still rankle you? It does, but uh, I was the only one in '92, uh, along with uh, Tony Curry as well. They ordered him to fight against Paul Douglas too. Both of us uh, sustained and didn't go to uh, Barcelona Olympics Games. Like you say, it's uh, every kid's dream to go to Olympic Games to represent their country. But uh, after that, um, I, d I just threw my head up and, get and walked away from the game. And that, and that must uh, disgust. And all thanks to my brother Noel. He, uh, he convinced me to come down and talk to him at Callaghan in uh, above his switch gym at the time. And uh, we had a good talk. And well, he made me train for at least 10 months before uh, we had our first. Uh, First uh, debut bill in the point in Dublin, which right. never since then we haven't looked back since '95. Right. Well, you turn you turned professional with McCallaghan, and you were trained by John Breen. Uh, you ran up a, a string of victories, and uh, your first defeat was in America, the, the world class Teddy Reed, and that was by split the season. Talk to me about that. Uh, like you say, he's, he's a world class fighter, um, Teddy Reed. Uh, maybe, maybe thought probably a lot of him. He was, he was just coming up. Uh, he was a terrible, terrible big dad. He was, he was, he was a hell of a lot heavier than me on the day. Uh, we asked him to um, remove some pounds. Uh, he, he was ominous. He didn't move any pounds. So the more or less says to me, well, if you don't fight, you don't get paid. So I had to take the fight. And then we just lost a split the season. Like you say, he's a world class fighter and he, he's, he's, he's been on to prove that. Right. Uh, you went on another unbeaten streak after that. And then you challenged Manchester's Paul Burke for the Commonwealth League Wilder well, title. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the only one in the hall thought that you lost that fight was a referee, but he was the one that mattered as he was the sole arbiter. Uh, it was a disgraceful and distasteful decision, and it was a big setback in your career. I remember speaking to you around about that time, and you say it's, uh, it's cost you a year of your career, it's set you back a year. Uh, how long did it take you to get Burke back in the ring? It took, it took me near enough exactly a year to get Burke back in the ring, but mainly it cost me a year. It cost me a year in earning big money. In uh, in uh, title defences and maybe um, moving my uh, career on a hell of a lot quicker than it should have been. Mm. Um, again, getting back to the referee, like I said, live on television that night. Uh, he was Stevie Wonder's Stevie Wonder's brother. Yes, I was disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful. But I'd never seen you as fired up in a rematch, and you were magnificent, absolutely magnificent. Yeah, well, me when I was going to bed at night, uh, preparing myself for the Paul Berg fight. Um, I was even sending myself it through my head. If I'm going down, I'm going to ask him. I'm going to ask him to get up because I'm not finished with him. I want to. I want to re really hurt him. Yeah. And again, although it's, it's bad, maybe a bad thing to say. I mean, it wasn't Paul that, that uh, put, put his hand up. It was a referee. Right. But uh, unfortunately, I had to be talking about somebody. I was talking about Paul Burke that night. Never really established himself in the fight, and that was his problem. A lovely little short right uppercut there, and he knows that Berg is in trouble with that punch. There it is. Just a short little right uppercut. And he wheeled away like a celebrating goal scorer in the Premiership after that, McKee. That was the next one. The second one just caught him. Just by the, the chin. Again, the celebrations from McGee. The legs would not obey. Still talking over there to Bur hey, Your next big fight was against Shane Neary, and that was in the, uh, the waterfront. Uh, people were expecting an explosive fight. And after having hurt him in the second round, it turned into a very technical fight. Uh, nevertheless, it was a very good win against a, a, a well-known opponent, and it put you into sort of world title contention. 
Uh, they also had a few wins, very, very good wins against the likes of Alan Temple, John Thaxton and Alan Bosworth. We were very, very impressive. And then uh, we're on to the Ricky Hatton fight. Uh, you had him down the first, you wobbled him badly in the second, cut him in the third, and uh, had him out on his feet in the twelfth and final round. Uh, I think if it had him been anywhere else, if it had him been in Ireland, you'd have got to the season. But they weren't going to give it against Ricky Hatton and his hometown, and, and a cauldron of atmospheric heat, you know. Uh, tell me, uh, you seem to be very railed up uh, by, by, by the pro Hatton, 100% pro Hatton crowd. Oh. You know, do you suffer from nerves? No, because if you never, do, you didn't seem to have any. Never, like, never did. Like I say, I'm 30 years at the game now, and I think um, we're well used to it. It's provide some on. We're well used to be able to uh, to get over wee things to get there. Um, but it was, it was actually hyping me on that night more and more than anything else. It was giving me a little bit more edge. Yeah. Uh, plus, we had 3,000 traveling traveling fans from uh, Belfast, which is fantastic. Uh, Concerning the Hatton fight, the worst thing that uh, I think I done to him was supposed to put him down in the first round, you know what I mean? Because then he knew that, uh, how, dangerous, yeah. how dangerous it could be. And he, and fair play to Hatton, he, he, uh, he, he, step, he stepped in and out, which is the thing that I didn't expect from him. Yeah. I mean, Do you have any regrets regarding that fight? Because you were so close to winning. I mean, that, that would have been your pension fight. If you had won that? Uh, yeah, yeah, because you always have a lot, of, a lot of regrets. But you're, if, if, if had yeah. been, you know, I mean, we're all professional fighters and you gotta, you got to do deal with what happens at the time. Yeah. So that's what happened then, he threw you off. I mean, I, I thought you were sitting in the ropes for long periods. And no, then well, well basically too, but when, the way I was thinking of my fight was, I mean, I was sick of going and watching them on television, watching them leave. And he's, he was bullying kids and bullying uh, fighters that shouldn't be in the ring with him. And he's beating them on the ropes and making them feel like fucking, making them, making them feel like wee boys. And I was saying, well, come and, come and see, see what you do about me. Right. Yeah, I mean, that'll suit me on the ground, and that's right. why I didn't stay up. That's why I stayed on the ropes. Right. So if you want to come and pay, come and pay. But yet he, yet he changed his techniques and started stepping in and stepping yeah. out. Eamon McGee, the hard man from Belfast. A slick counter puncher. He's been around the block and he's been talking a good fight in the run up to this. Really fancies his chances. Oh, and he's caught him! He's caught him with that right hand, and for the first time in his career, Ricky Hatton is down. Are we going to see a big upset? In the second round, and Hatton's going to work. Key moments here, you sense. Has Hatton weathered the storm? At the moment, you could really put this fight on in the proverbial telephone box. Good infighting from Hatton, though. Oh, but McGee comes off the ropes so well, and Hatton gets caught again. Oh, and I think Mickey Van's done Ricky Hatton a bit of a favour there. McGee saying, come on, let's let the fight go on, and McGee fancies it here, and Hatton, just for a moment, wants to hold on again. Oh, and he's being tagged by real power shots from the Irishman, and once again, is it going to be the big upset? McGee has fancied this right the way through, and even now he's still trying to throw bombs. But Hatton rode out the storm and in the end matched the Irishman for skill, maybe bettered him. But his youthful fire and vigour has proved all important. It's going to go down to the three judges, though, by the looks of it. And what will the three wise men say? This has been Hatton's hardest night, though. And there we go. Hatton thinks he's done it. And a lot of respect between the two men as well. There ought to be. McGee chaired around the ring. The Manchester crowd don't like it. McGee thinks he might have done enough. As an amateur, I won nine Anthem titles, nine Ulster titles and five Irish titles. As a professional, I won the Irish Cruiserweight title. That was um, 13 years ago, which I'm still a champion. I won the Commonwealth Cruiserweight title. I won the IBO, Con IBO Continental 
Crucial Red Table and I won the IBO Continental Light Heavyweight Table. The proudest moment in my career would have been maybe would have been my first table, which was the Irish Cruiserweight title as a professional. You know, but as an amateur, my proudest moment as an amateur was standing first in Ireland versus England. See, when you stand to land nice on anthem and it's your country and you're representing your country, there's no no better better moment than that. And my dad was a, a photo sitting in the gap of Chris Finnegan, and he was wearing the uh, British belt and the Olympic gold medal. It was the last gold medal until all the house won it. And I had always a dream, you know, that hopefully someday one of my dad sent me one of my pals around him with a medal. I won a medal at the Multi Nations in Italy and I also won four belts, you know. So, dream came true. Uh -huh. This is that body shot within the A's. Very quick to get on his bike. Dominguez and Corbett looking to work the body where there's not much resistance oh, 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 When Corbett is bad, he's awful. When he's good, he's explosive. I'm here at the Ulster Hall with one of the legends of uh, Irish boxing, Neil Sinclair. Uh, Neil was a uh, Lonsdale belt outright winner, also Commonwealth Games gold medalist. And there's his Lonsdale belt there, uh, being displayed at the Ulster Hall along with Rinty Monaghan, Rinty's undisputed world championship belt. Uh, Neil, uh, I just want to ask you, uh, what's your experience of Ardoin boxers? Well, my experience is uh, with Eamon McGee and Eamon McCauley. I've sparred both uh, many times. And Eamon, Eamon McCauley, I remember sparring in the Holy Family when I was an amateur. And <laughs> we've, done about, we've done over 100 rounds, but on the last round of the last spar we ever had, he, he connected a, a thunderous right hand on my, on my nose. and. Didn't help the shape of it very much, but uh, so that was the, that was that was a good experience. Not, uh, and then when I was in John Brain's gym, I sparred a lot of rounds with Eamon McGee. You know, learned a lot with Eamon. He's a class southpaw boxer, and I meant that any time I fought a southpaw, I had no problems with him because of, of all the rounds I'd done with Eamon McGee. And two of my two of my good friends. Sean and Tony McNulty, their brothers, and they, they, they boxed as amateurs for Sacred Heart, and they were very good in their own right. So, so and I know Freddie Gilroy, obviously, is the great, the great boxer from Ardoin. And also a few bone men, uh, Paddy Barnes. Paddy Barnes, Darren Corbett, boxed a lot with Darren Corbett, so it's very rich in boxing talent. Hello, I'm up in Ballymena here and I'm with one of the legends of Irish boxing, Eamon Loughran. Eamon won a silver medal in the World Juniors. He was Commonwealth Professional Champion and he was also WBO World Welterweight Professional Champion. Uh, Eamon, do you have any experiences uh, with Ardoin or Ardoin boxers? Yes, uh, great times along with Ardoin boxing clubs. There was a rivalry between the old Saints in the early days when I was boxing and Ardoin Sacred Heart Boxing Club uh, and also remember all us fighting and sparring with them, training with them, going to Dublin with them. Guys like Eamon McGee, Corbett's, the Corbett brothers. Uh, I actually fought one of the guys from Ardoin, I'm trying to think of his name. I sure. think it was Enos Keenan. Enos Keenan, oh, that's correct, a uh, good fighter from Ardoin. I uh, fought him, so I did. Uh, I sparred Eamon McGee, so I did in All Saints Boxing Club. And we were coming up around the same time, there was a rivalry there, although we never fought. 
So we never just there was a half a def stone of difference in our weight. And also spurred yourself, Eamon. So it had 50, 60 rounds in Eastmans. Yeah. So it had and, uh, uh, some great times. And everyone won competitive. Everyone competitive. And then also you spurred my brother, see that he spurred the pair of us, see that you know, so uh, uh, fantastic. And, yeah. And Freddie Gilroy. Uh, Freddie Gilroy was everybody's hero. Yeah, you know, legend. He, was, he was the legend, so he was. He came out of our uh -huh. line, so he was. Yeah. Uh, but you never actually fought, Mickey. I remember that rivalry. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to see that fight. But I didn't even know you sparred. Mm -hmm. And did you say you cut him? I had him in, I cut him in the nose, so they had an All Saints amateur boxing club. We couldn't get. Uh, they wouldn't take the fight down in All Saints, so they wouldn't. And. Uh, we wouldn't take it up there, and it just never came to that. Came, we fought guys that he'd beat everybody, I'd beat it, and I'd beat everybody, he'd beat it. So, but it, it would have been a good fight if I had it. Oh, would have been a good fight. Uh, it would have been hard to pick a winner. Two there. punchers. Uh, yeah, man, thanks very much for speaking to me. Boxers from from Ardoin and, and that direction, there's, there's plenty of them off the top of my head. You've got Gilroy. Um, Great, great fighter. Met him a couple of times when I was a kid. Always a nice guy. I think he uh, he still trains and down at Grove Grove Leisure Centre as well. Um, Eamon McGee, obviously people know what he you know he gave Hatton one of his toughest fights coming up. Uh, nearly had him over. Nearly had him beat as well. Big Darren Corbett, big punching guy. Um, your own son, uh, Coco, massive puncher, real real big hitter. Um, and it, it's a shame he's not boxing anymore. And, and yourself, I heard, heard you were half days in your day too, you mean? Way back in the day. All right. Well, that's that's it. But there's there's loads, and there's so many. I'm sure I'm missing. Paddy Barnes. Uh, you had one, a few I, scraps with Paddy. Had a few. In actual fact, <laughs> I I think I was at the fight when Paddy beat you. Right. So I was going to win. I thought Paddy had just just had fought the once. Right. And I was going to wind you right up. You may beat the best in Britain and Europe and the world, but you can't beat the Ardoin oh, man. Right, right. So I rang Paddy to confirm, and he says, yes, I did beat Carl, but Carl beat me back three times. Oh, yeah, that's so right. I went out to Wendy. That's but right, but he says, if Carl's an honourable man, he'll tell you I know what that you're I was robbed. He's a spoofer. He's, he, speaks, he talks about it any time he makes a chance on the radio and stuff. He's, ah, oh, it should be two each and all, but listen, judges never done this club any favour, and... Uh, I beat him three times. That's it. I won the first. He won the he won the third fight. So I won the last one. So that's that's all that counts. He, he wasn't bad, my Paddy, but uh, he's come on since then as well. I I, I put it down to a couple of them beatings that I gave him. Why he's, why he's won a couple of them medals. All right. <laughs> and you've come on well yourself. Uh, thanks very much for speaking to McCoy. No problem, man. Cheers. Man. It was just before twelve noon when Paddy Barnes entered the arena. Beijing may be thousands of miles away, but his friends and family in Ardoin made sure they were going to be heard. Nervous moments for all concerned. I'm um, a bit nervous, but I uh, have every confidence that he's, he's going to do well. Normally a slow starter, Barnes did well in the first. It was two points each against the highly rated pole, Mazchik. If he was cautious in the first, not so the second. A Barnes storming two minutes when he frequently landed scoring shots. 7-5, looking good. He's doing everything it's asked of him. He, uh, he's boxing very, very well. Two rounds to go. Uh, let's just hope he can hang in there. He did more than hang in. The pole wasn't to score again. Barnes stuck to his task. A comprehensive display. 9-5 after the third. His watching Granny Phyllis almost couldn't take the tension. In the end, it was 11-5, a bronze medal, huge relief and huge emotion all round. I used to go to boxing, but it was all right, but when you're watching your own, it's different. And the support you got here in the community is fantastic. You can do anything now. That's right. It's fit for anything. Absolutely fantastic performance by Patrick. Brilliant. Just over the moon for him. He doesn't realise any of this is happening. He doesn't realise what's happening back home. He's in a cocoon. He's in a village. He doesn't know what's happening. He's just boxing. I just wanna, Just want to finish off... Uh, Maxley Holden, Paddy's Olympic bronze medal. Uh, there's not too many of these about, very, very rare. And uh, there we go, an Olympic bronze medal. Now, normally Le Bone would give us an Ardoin a hard time over it, but we have an Olympic bronze medalist too in Freddie Gilroy, who won in 56. You know what them bone men are like? So that's one each.
fed there to uh, poor Daniels and uh, I caught him a couple of games in the fourth round, you know, I thought I had him going. Let's hear it. I thought he got better looking. He had a great note behind him. He had a full support game. Hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Let's hear it. This here goes back a little fucking time, you know what I mean? I only was done, wasn't it, in big strides? You had your whole family in the corner. Have a look at it. How did this have been on too long? I have to return back. This has been on 30 years now, you know? I have to return 30 odd years. Nobody, nobody's ever got a clean record. I don't think it was settled in it. No, it's not settled in it. I wore my red vest and eat now, of course. As far as I'm concerned, it'll be an order of fun fight as soon as possible. Let's open the purse off it. We're cutting out of the wood. Let's open the purse off it. Can I put it down the purse down with anybody? I'll give you, I'll give you. I'll give you a short break. But I knew it was coming, coming down the road. I'll give you a dirt of present up. What? Well, that's fine. You no, no. You can turn up the stairs at night. You can have the rake on, eh? Yeah, I'd put that inside that. Oh, well, that's that's the argument. <laughs> yeah, dirt. That's yeah. that's the argument. Who okay, cares? If you're a third match, I'll hurt you. Right. Sit around around around. Right. Well, sooner or later, I'll be sat once and for all. Right, we'll see you next time around then. Right. Right. The battle of Belfast.